Good morning. Thank you all for joining us for this event. And thanks to those of you who will watch the video of this event uh, at a later time. I am Michael Strain, Director of Economic Policy Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event to discuss the publication of Rebalancing Children First. This report documents the recommendations, conclusions, and analysis of the AEI Brookings Working Group on Childhood. The working group consists of experts in child development and early learning, education policy, health and employment policy, and consists of sociologists, economists, and social scientists. Members of the group differ greatly in their political philosophy and in their opinions on the proper size and scope of government. I think it's safe to say that no one member agrees with every recommendation or every conclusion in this report. But all members agree that the United States is not investing enough in children. And all members agree that the recommendations and conclusions in the report taken as a whole would improve on the status quo. The report argues not just for additional investment in kids, but for a rebalancing of government expenditures toward children. In 2019, 9% of the federal budget was spent on children, while 45% went to spending on adults through the Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid programs. Hundreds of billions of dollars more were spent on subsidies to favored industries and through the tax code on programs benefiting the upper middle class. The federal budget is not just an accounting document. It reflects the moral priorities of the nation. This report argues that those priorities are out of whack. Importantly, the report argues that additional investments in children should be financed by redirecting existing spending that currently benefits wealthier adults. The report argues that the additional spending for children this report recommends should take place without adding to the deficit. For some members, this recommendation exists out of concern over the level of federal spending and borrowing. But for all members, this recommendation is driven by the view that the nation's priorities as reflected in the federal budget need to change. I'm delighted to kick off a discussion of these important issues. I'm especially honored that Dr. Cecilia Rouse, chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors and Senator Mitt Romney are here today to discuss their perspective on childhood in America. I'm also honored to be joined by Diane Schanzenbach, director of the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University by David Deming, a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School, Lisa Ganichian, professor at the Stanford School of Public Policy at Duke University, Kosali Simon, a professor at Indiana University, my AEI colleague, Brad Wilcox, a professor at the University of Virginia, and Richard Reeves of the Brookings Institution. Next up is Dr. Schanzenbach, who will introduce more of the report and who will then moderate a conversation with Chair Rouse. Following their conversation, I will have a conversation with Senator Romney. We encourage you to submit questions for Dr. Rouse and for Senator Romney on Twitter using the hashtag uh, AskAEIEcon. You are also welcome to email your questions to Mariana Mitchell at mariana.mitchell at AEI.org. You can find the spelling of her email address on the webpage for this event. Following those two conversations, at 12.20 p.m. Eastern Time, we will have a panel discussion with the members of the working group that I had just mentioned. Thank you again for joining us, and thank you to our distinguished speakers. And with that, I turn the microphone over to Diane. Thank you, Micah. And let me also extend my welcome. Let me start by providing a brief overview of our work and the report that's been released today. Childhood is a consequential time to make investments that last a lifetime. The foundations laid during childhood in terms of health, education, character development, and more, they deeply influence the quality of children's economic and social lives as adults. Yet many children in the United States do not have the resources or relationships they need to build strong foundations. Since 2019, scholars at AEI and Brookings have convened a working group of leading experts to study the challenges and opportunities facing children in America. As Michael said, our working group members represent a wide range of academic disciplines, as well as vastly different views on the proper role of government and of the effectiveness of government programs. 
but we came together to agree on common values, interrogate the evidence, and debate solutions. We all agree on the need to rebalance our national investments toward children. Importantly, we support substantially increasing public investments in children, but in the context of budget neutrality. Now, beyond that, coming to this final consensus report was not easy and required substantial compromise. Indeed, no individual group member wholeheartedly supports everything in this 128-page report. In many cases, individual members oppose particular items, and there are topics on which some members think we push too far, and others think we did not push far enough. But all group members agree that the recommendations and conclusions in the report, taken as a whole, would greatly improve the status quo. Too many families live with inadequate economic resources, a situation which hurts children in both the short and the long run. The working group endorses increasing resources to low-income families through enhancements to the child tax credit and to SNAP. The report acknowledges the fundamental importance of good parenting to children's development. We should encourage young adults to be ready for parenthood before starting a family, and a healthy relationship between children's parents is critical to their well-being. Since the most common route to a healthy and stable parental relationship is through marriage, the group supports policies to strengthen and encourage marriage and clear public messages about its importance for children. We also recognize a central role for parents' employment in the outcomes of their children. As a result, we support policies that help parents acquire new skills that lead to better jobs, along with an expansion of the earned income tax credit that promotes and rewards employment. We recognize the importance of access to health care and the value of public health insurance for children, and that there are a wide range of social determinants of health that we can and should address. The report concludes that there's a strong case for investing more in schools, and it recommends support for programs that provide targeted instruction to struggling students. Now, recognizing the profound effect that teachers have on learning, the U.S. needs to improve its systems for developing skills and improving instruction so that more children can have access to excellent classroom teachers. Along with greater resources, the working group believes that schools and the adults who work in them should be held accountable for student outcomes. We also acknowledge the importance of protecting children from economic instability and recognize that there are long lasting effects of economic recessions on children, stemming both from parental job loss and also from the reductions in public investments that occur during these times, such as decreased school spending. Now, of course, COVID has caused even more damage than a typical recession does, not only through learning losses that by one recent estimate could cost the U.S. students $2 trillion in lost lifetime earnings, but also through its toll on children's mental health and experiences of instability. In the wake of COVID, rebalancing our investments toward children has a new urgency. We hope that this report can spark and support a wider conversation about how we should be supporting children and attaining the resources and the relationships they need to thrive. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome the chair of President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors, Cecilia Rouse. Prior to joining the cabinet, she was the Dean of Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and Professor of Economics. Chair Rouse and her CEA staff offer the president objective economic advice on both domestic and international policy. They base their recommendations and analysis on economic research and empirical evidence and use the best data available to support the president in setting our nation's economic policy. Welcome, Chair Rouse. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me kick off with a couple of questions, and we'll certainly get more from, from the audience. Perfect. To start... President Biden has proposed an ambitious agenda on families. And of course, we hope that this report and the evidence that we assemble will be helpful to you in your work. So let me start off by asking from your perspective, why are national investments in children so important? Well, um, I, you've chosen a topic which is near and dear to my heart and on which I have spoken as well. I think this is a really important piece of President Biden's economic agenda. Um, so first, let me just start with uh, you know, a couple of intertwined questions. One is why is investing ch in children so important? And two, why is this why is there a role for government in doing this? So in the first, so we're economists, so we think about human capital. We're looking for ways to improve economic growth and to improve the welfare of people in the United States. So we want to invest in their human capital. We think of that very broadly as both education, 
um, health, mental health, you just mentioned in terms of the impacts of COVID, but all the things that make us who we are. And we, of course, we want people to be happy and productive citizens of the country. And that doesn't just mean working, but as labor economists, I'm going to focus on the labor market. So that was my full throated <laughs> understanding that I really, in my mind, I think of something broader, but I do, we do tend to focus on the outcomes uh, in the economic side. So um, the reason, so we think that investments in people, that's a key component of growth. And how do we improve human capital? So we make investments. Now investments are the, the kinds of expenditures where we pay something today in expectation, in expectation for something tomorrow. Uh, there are some characteristics of investments that are common. Uh, this is not just the stock market, this is people as well. One is that there's some risk involved and we have to acknowledge that. We spend money today on kids. It doesn't mean that everybody's gonna grow up to be a healthy, happy, you know, well-adjusted adult who's a productive citizen uh, because there's some risk. Uh, but I have to say in the, in the realm of risky investments, human capital is uh, one of the least risky there is, but there is some risk. And second, it requires patience. So we are making expenditures up front for a return tomorrow. Now we do this all the time. We buy homes, we invest in the stock market, we make other kinds of investments on the capital side, but we also need to be making them when it comes to people. So when we think about children, this is one of the toughest human capital investments because we're putting money in our youngest children and we wait and we wait and we wait. And some of the outcomes happen sooner than later. For example, we know that investments in pre-K can reduce expenditures on special education. There's less grade repetition. They're less likely to drop out of high school. So some of those happen a little more, um, little more quickly, but other returns happen in the labor market, which can be what, 20, 30, 40 years later. Economists, when they've tried to roll all of that up, have found overwhelmingly, especially these economists like Nathan Hendren and his co-author, Ben Sprunkheiser, have found that the, when we make these kinds of investments, when the government makes these kinds of investments, the total cost, when they think of the cost of, of making the investments, and then when they take out uh, the, it, the fact that uh, people who've had good pre-K, um, when we, who've had the, their parents have had adequate resources to pay for them and to give them adequate food and other enrichment. Uh, so when we've, we've given families, so we've made those investments in children, that they um, earn more in the labor market, which means that they pay more in taxes, they're less likely to rely on benefits. We know that they commit fewer crimes, which means that they're not drawing on the resources in criminal justice. When we roll all of that up net net, these kinds of investments pay for themselves and they pay for themselves multiple times over. So this is a good investment. And importantly, I just noted that some of those benefits accrue to not just the individual person, but they also accrue to the rest of us. So we know that the social benefits are bigger than the private benefits, which means that if we just left it to the individual families and, and children themselves to make these investments, you know, the little ones don't have as much money, but when we come to even thinking about older, adult, older kids who can make choices, um, the, the benefits to all of us are bigger than the benefits to the individual, which means that the individual won't do as much as we as a society need for them and want for them to do. So, so first of all, this is an investment that pays for itself multiple times over. And two, there's a role for government because the benefits to everybody are bigger than the individual benefits to the individual. And I know you have one asked me other things, but I'm going to make one other rationale for the government to be involved, which is credit constraints. So oftentimes when families are, you know, when most people have children, they're not at the height of their earnings potential at that point. And therefore, they're not able to make all of the investments in, in their children that they would like to make. One way that we've thought about it at the Council of Economic Advisors is if we look at expenditures on, on enrichment activities by parents on their children, we go back to the early 1970s. Wealthier families are spending four times those in the upper quartile are spending four times those in the lower quartile in terms of income on enrichment activities of their kids. So you see that difference. I don't think we're going to want to argue that there's wealthy parents care four times more for their children or have four times more ambitions for their children's outcomes. But the, the lower income families just don't have the resources to do what they would like to do. And importantly, when we fast forward to today, that gap has grown to almost seven times. So not only do we see that the wealthy families are able to provide this kind of enrichment, uh, lower income families are not. And so it behooves us, we can either work through credit markets, which we know that can be slow and messy, uh, or this is provides yet another rationale for the federal government or state governments to be involved. So these are important investments. I'm so glad you have this report, which is highlighting them, but those, that's some of how we think about it at the CEA. Thank you. And 
the academics on this uh, will just continue to try to build good evidence you know, for you and other policymakers to, uh, to use toward these ends. Uh, so my next question for you is why now? Why is it the right time now to be in increasing our investments in children? Is it the right time? Well, it's always the right time, right? Children are being born every day. And so, you know, are we going to lose yet another generation, another year, another set of kids that we're not making the best investments in uh, that we really need to be making? So this is a question of, this is an opportunity cost, that if we don't make those investments today, these children are not going to grow into being the most productive, happy, well-adjusted adults uh, that they will be later. So, it, you know, this is a perennial question. Uh, one could argue, as you did in your opening statement, that especially if you think of COVID, COVID and the impact on education, on the educational system, you know, the Kane and Goldhaber and their co-authors estimate is just stunning. And is that going to be the first of many? The, the learning loss has been so profound and the impact where some kids have just completely disconnected from their educational systems, that is going to be, um, that, that's going to be a cost that we will be trying to make up for for years, if not decades. And so it behooves us to get in now and try to compensate for that learning loss uh, starting today. Um, the mental health impacts, we know that those are profound too, and that's not only making it very difficult for those kids today, but that will also follow them into their adulthood. So, you know, babies are born every day. We need to be making investments in these children. The opportunity cost of not doing so is only growing. Let me ask you a couple of sort of more in the weeds questions. So in our report, we find that parental employment is really important for children. And as a result, we advocate a mix of programs that both reward work and also provide some support for getting a better job. Mm -hmm. Now, while some people have called for lift, uh, limiting some of our public investments in children to families in which the parents are employed, we don't uh, in this working group report. Notably, the working group supports reforms to the child tax credit that allow families with no income to participate, as was the case following the American Rescue Plan. So what would children miss? Well, one, do you agree with us? And two, what would children miss if we conditioned programs like the child tax credit on parents' employment? Well, look, I think it's important that our tax system not disincentivize employment. You know, some parents want to stay home with their children and that's and we have to celebrate that. That's very important. But we don't want to disincentivize those who otherwise would want to work and need to work or want to be part of the, the labor market. Uh, but I think it's important to think about what's the portfolio of tools and policies that we have and what's the goal of those policies. I think of you know, policies such as the Earned Income Tax Credit, the EITC, as being the place for us to be encouraging work and to be helping people make, especially low income work pay uh, so that it makes sense to, to actually join the labor market. The child tax credit should be our way of helping to improve the lives of children. And so when we condition it on their parents working, what we're doing is we're gonna cut out and not provide the benefits to probably the children for whom the, the return would be the highest. So I think the, the biggest argument for why I personally would not be in favor of having a work requirement is twofold. One, I think that is not having parents work is not the goal of the CTC or the child tax credit. It's really to make the lives of children better. And overall, when people have studied the child tax credit and not other forms of providing income support to families with children, uh, we find that the returns are multiple times over. So we know that that's a good investment. That said, we don't want to discourage work. And so there's a, uh, there's a fierce debate among economists as to the extent to which the child tax credit, if it's especially if it's refundable, would actually discourage work. Um, should I just go there, Diane? Sure, please. Okay, right. So we know that there have been three or four simulations that have tried to look at what would be the potential impact of, the child, of a refund, fully refundable child tax credit on labor supply of, of the parents. So the most notable that gets a lot of attention is that by Bruce Meyer and his colleagues um, at the University of Chicago. When we've looked at his estimates and those of others, we see that his is an outlier, right? So I'm not saying that it, he, you know, he made certain assumptions, and, but it is an outlier on, on two fronts. One is, uh, you know, they suggest, they use a very high elasticity of labor supply for one. I and mean, then two, they suggest that very high income people would reduce their labor supply in response to this tax credit in a way that really is not plausible and most people would not assume. 
even just by taking out the, assume, the assumption of a response among high income families, that would reduce his estimated impact on labor supply by quite a bit. And then if we sort of substitute in an elasticity, you know, using after tax income, using an after tax elasticity, and one that is more in the mainstream of estimated elasticities, his impacts on, on labor supply are more in line with what others have found. So yes, there may be a small impact on labor supply of families, but then we have to ask ourselves overall, because no policy is perfect. One is we know that the benefits to the children likely outweigh the, the small negative impact of labor supply of the parents. And part of what we're doing with the child tax credit is actually increasing the labor supply of children in the future. So when we think about the trade-off, are we thinking of the labor supply of the parents today, or are we thinking of the welfare and the labor supply of their children uh, in the future? That was brilliantly put. Thank you for that. Uh, another question that I've got is in the report we're releasing today, one of the ways that we were able to develop consensus across this sort of uh, widely di you know, diverse group uh, was to endorse a common commitment to fiscal responsibility among these investments. So a question for you is, can we simultaneously make these new investments and also make them budget neutral? You no, know, absolutely. And the president is also committed to that kind of fiscal responsibility. And in, the, uh, you know, in his proposals for Build Back Better, there is a healthy set of uh, revenue, uh, tax revenue proposals. Uh, the administration has been very frank, however, um, that it's more agnostic about how one goes about raising these kinds of revenues and is open uh, to different kinds of tax reform. But we do know that our income has become much more skewed our wealth has become much more skewed in this country, that some of our wealthiest uh, citizens don't necessarily pay their fair share of taxes, that the IRS has not had the resources to enforce the tax code as it is. And so it's important that we all pay our fair share and that, in, yeah, and that we use the funds that, uh, for, that we would raise from these revenue raisers to make the kinds of investments that, are, that we know will pay off in the future and that will improve economic growth going forward. So absolutely, I think it's an important uh, point. And we also, I just wanna add that that's part of the reason why the kinds of investments of the, like the child tax credit would not be inflationary even in the short term uh, because they would be accompanied by uh, some revenue increases, right? Which we know provides a little bit of breaks on the economy. Um, and these are long-term investments. We're not just spending the total, you know, the total 10-year cost of which whatever size inversion child tax credit we may be talking about, you know, in, in one year that is spread out over, you know, say a decade or into the future if it's permanent. So, uh, you know, the nature of these kinds of investments, they really are investments. It's not stimulus. Uh, but they should, they, they, you know, absolutely the president believes in that kind of fiscal responsibility as well. That's fantastic, and we can do it. Um, I, I'm just switching gears a little bit, um, I one of the chapters of this report that I'm proudest of is on early life. And, uh, you know, we highlight just those crucial early years where both resources and relationships are key for brain development. You might have seen just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, an all-star team of researchers, including our own Lisa Genetian here, uh, you know, did a study of a randomized controlled trial where some families with young children were given extra resources and they could map out uh, benefits on children's brain development. I really sort of a blockbuster study. Um, uh, in your version of the child tax credit, uh, you provided more resources to families with the youngest children, I think partially in, um, in recognition of this. So uh, what else, you know, what else do you have to say about why it's so important to ensure adequate resources to these families with the youngest children? Well, I, you, you've just articulated them, Diane, but I think this raises another, uh, a, another important initiative to this administration, which is paid family and sick leave. And so having, you know, many workers have access to some version of paid sick leave, but it's far fewer workers that have access to the kinds of parental of family leave that many families need, especially in the first weeks, couple of months of life, whether that child is adopted or is a natural birth, to allow for exactly the kind of bonding that you have just um, highlighted and promoted. Because what we need to do is to be encouraging the family bonds. But we also want to make it that, that the parents who choose to go to work and want to go to work have the resources to balance that, to you know, to balance our work with high quality childcare and universal pre-K. 
So when you talk about the importance of those kinds of investments, we don't just want to park our children and make sure that they have somebody to make sure they don't eat the, you know, the lead paint in the building. Uh, but we want to have somebody who's actually, you know, providing the kind of nourishing, uh, both emotionally and intellectually kind of environment, stimulating environment for these kids. Um, so that, again, they grow up to be well-adjusted, happy and productive. So, you know, both on both ends of that, this administration also has really, uh, you know, shares the value of placing those resources among our youngest children. Uh, so we're starting to get a great stream of questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, one of them um, is uh, th they say that uh, more than 90% of children in immigrant families are US citizens. I think that's probably something, something like that. Um, yet many of them either are excluded from key social safety net programs or, you know, in recent years have sort of been chilled off of these. Uh, you know, what can we do to, uh, to make sure that our investments in children extend to children of immigrant families? Yeah, so I don't want to get over my skis because this is sure. a legal area that I don't know a lot about, but I can assure you that this administration is you know, doing whatever it can, uh, whether it's through administrative authority, you know, there are parts of this have to work with Congress, uh, which is a, you know, whole, the Olympics are on, you know, the double twist back double back somersault <laughs> uh, <laughs> movement that it is now. Um, but we understand the importance of immigrants to our, um, to our economy. And especially as you just highlighted, these children which are, are here and when they are already eligible for the benefits, you know, ensuring that they are able to take, understand them and are able to take them up. Right, and many of the same arguments that we've made about investing in children, Absolutely. of course, you know, follow through here, um, Absolutely. grow up and contribute to our economy, et cetera. Yep. Um, one of the li lingering impacts of COVID, of course, is many people have lost their caregiver. They've lost parents, they've lost grandparents. Um, what can we do to you know, help ensure that our kids grow up um, healthy, to recover from this, uh, you know, as you know, it sort of sure looks like we're coming to the end of this COVID, you know, knock, <laughs> knock wood, hopefully we'll get to, uh, you know, but the economy is recovering. It just feels like, you know, a lot of things are, are moving in the right direction. What more should we be doing, if, especially around the health of children? Right. I mean, this is this is a challenge. I think many care workers uh, um, ha, are, have been burnt out by this pandemic uh, to boot. I know we are very concerned about the teaching labor force. Uh, the the many teachers are reporting that they may retire at the end of this year. That the balancing the online in person. Uh, kids who've got really are stressed out themselves, have mental health challenges, haven't been in a classroom, haven't been properly socialized and working with others since they've been at home. It's become a very challenging, stressful job. So one is, as part of the American Rescue Plan, there were funds available to state and local governments to help open, keep our schools open and to uh, use those resources to help us get through this tail end part of the pandemic. And the administration has been encouraging them to use those resources in ways to help keep our schools open. And that can include providing extra resources for teachers to help keep them in the classroom. The, the administration also as part of Build Back Better, you know, is very much wants to support the care workforce by improving their wages, improving their working conditions, and so that it becomes a more attractive uh, choice for many workers and that they're fairly compensated for the very important work that they're doing. Um, so, you know, we've got to get our labor, our labor market has had historic uh, improvements over the past year, but we know that many other workers are still sitting by the sidelines as they wait for us to get to even a more stable place in the pandemic, uh, maybe needing to stabilize their childcare situations. But we know that we're going to need to have an active, vibrant, engaged uh, care workforce as well. Yeah, I love the um, yeah the importance of the supply side is really Absolutely. there and developing that, et cetera. You know, it all sort of comes down to supply and demand in so many yep. ways, as so many things do. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair Rouse, thank you so much for being with us today. I learned a lot, and we really appreciate appreciate your time. I'm going to turn thank it back so over much. to Michael Strain. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Diane. Let me add my thanks to Chair Rouse as well, and let me. Welcome, Senator Mitt Romney. Uh, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. I'll read a, a brief biography, uh, re a brief introduction of you, although, of course, uh, no introduction is required. 
Mitt Romney was sworn in as Senator from Utah in January of 2019. He currently serves on the Foreign Relations, Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, Homeland Security and Government Affairs and Budget Committees. He is also a member of the Senate National Security Working Group. In 2021, he was honored with the John F. Kennedy Library's Profile and Courage Award for his consistent defense of the fundamental principles of democratic governance. As part of the G10 Working Group of Bipartisan Senators, Mr. Romney played a key role in enacting landmark legislation that makes investments in our nation's physical infrastructure. Prior to serving in the Senate, Mr. Romney served as governor of Massachusetts from 2003 to 2007. He also led the 2002 Salt Lake Organizing Committee for the Winter Olympics and was Republican nominee for president of the United States uh, in 2012. Um, Senator, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Michael. Good to, uh, good to join you. And uh, I apologize for you having to run through all of that, uh, that background. I, I'm afraid people know me so well already, there's nothing new to tell them. <laughs> Let me begin with a, a big picture question for you. There, there seems to be greater interest on both the political left and the political right in offering more support uh, uh, for families with children. Uh, why do you think that is? What do you, what do you think about that? Well, we probably come at this um, uh, issue from uh, different points of view initially, and, uh, and there may be a meeting towards the middle. I think for, for those on the left, uh, uh, they come from the standpoint of poverty and trying to help people that are poor and, and help kids uh, have good meals and clothing and shelter and health care and so forth, a certainly laudable um, uh, objective. Uh, many on the right, in addition to having those concerns, uh, are drawn to the fact that people aren't having as many kids as they used to. We're not replacing ourselves. Uh, those that are uh, American by birth here and, uh, and their uh, families are finding that their, uh, their kids are not getting married as early as they used to 20, 30 years ago. Uh, they're not having as many children. And as you ask people why they're not having as many kids, they often say, well, I'd, I'd like to have more children, but we just can't afford it. And uh, that's certainly not the only reason people are having fewer children today. Uh, there are cultural reasons as well, but, but financial reasons are part of that. So I think Republicans are saying, uh, you know, uh, if we want to maintain our civilization uh, and replace ourselves, uh, we, we want to provide help to people that want to have kids and, uh, and are concerned about their financial capacity to do so. So both those things are, are coming together in a way, and I, and I don't want to overcharacterize people on the right or the left in terms of their, uh, their, their initial uh, uh, inclinations, but I, I think there's a recognition that there's probably something we should do here. And I, I note one more thing, and that is that the, the way the programs work today uh, to help families are, uh, are really not having the kind of impact that they ought to have given the amount that we spend. Uh, and, uh, and, and the money's not being able to improve the lives of our kids the way we'd like it to. And there's a marriage penalty associated with it. And, uh, and, and kids are not getting the benefit of the, of the funding in some cases. So there's a sense that you know, we, we might want to restructure uh, the way we have the programs uh, to, to make them more effective. Let me come back to marriage uh, in a second. Um, let me stick with uh, programs for, for kids. I think that there are uh, many people who would like to do more for children, uh, but they're concerned about the uh, effects of doing more for children on the parents of those children. Uh, there's concern that if we were to offer a more generous child tax credit, more generous food stamp benefits, that that might lead to less employment for the parents of those kids. How do you how do you balance those two uh, competing concerns when when you think about uh, appropriate policy and program design? Well, as you know, that's one of the the uh, uh, considerations uh, that that uh, is being held by those of us that are working in this area, which is how do we encourage work. And at the same time, uh, provide uh, funding so that people feel they can have kids. Uh, clearly, the kind of uh, refundable tax credit we're talking about 
is small enough that uh, uh, moms and dads are not going to retire on these payments or come anywhere near to retiring on these payments. They're, they're small, but, but nonetheless, they're helpful to, to people that are uh, planning on having children and ultimately having those kids. And, um, and of course, one of the, the questions is, should there be some requirement that people are, are working? And um, uh, in the case of a, a couple, uh, you may have um, a husband and wife that are today both working, uh, and uh, and if you provided some um, uh, support for the the child or children of that home, it's possible that one or the other uh, of those individuals might decide to stop working. I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Uh, I think as a society, uh, you know, I'll let the sociologists weigh in, but I guess if uh, if you have a husband and wife. Uh, or a partnership between two people that are raising children, that one of them deciding, hey, I'm gonna stay out of the workforce, uh, at least for the first four or five or maybe six years of the child's life, may be a good thing. And, and instead of government saying, no, 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 we, we, we do not want you to, uh, to, to stay home, we want you to go into the workforce, I, I'm not sure that's the right thing. So the, the plan that, that I proposed uh, does not penalize a couple if one of them decides to stay home and have uh, a, a child rearing responsibility and another one decides to work. But, but I very much am open to the, the need uh, that many have expressed to say, look, there, there's got to be some connection with work. Uh, the, 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 the couple or a single parent has to have at least worked before the child came into their life and show that they've been paying taxes and, and going to work so that you, you, don't, uh, you don't create a, uh, a pathway to, to sort of a permanent um, uh, you know, life on the government uh, uh, largesse uh, and, and an incentive to have more and more kids so you get more, more and more support. So you you uh, made passing reference, Senator, to your own, your own plan for this. Let me ask you directly about that. Uh, a year ago, you released a plan called the Family Security Act. And this plan would have reformed existing federal tax provisions and programs into a monthly benefit for families. Uh, it received wide praise on both the left and the right, and it received wide criticism on both the left and the right. Uh, let me ask you uh, where things stand with, with the plan now. A lot, a lot has happened since you since you introduced it, um, and, and where do things stand uh, now, and, and how are you thinking about it going forward? Well, I think uh, all the cards went up in the air when the president introduced uh, his own plan, the uh, Build Back Better plan, and uh, he basically uh, shared my point of view that, that monthly uh, support for families with children made more sense to get help to kids than just giving them a tax credit at the end of the year. Uh, but there were some big differences. One is he didn't reform the current programs. His program was just an additional uh, amount of money that went on top of programs that already existed uh, and therefore became substantially more expensive. And, and I, you know, I don't want to overcharacterize my liberal friends, but many have a point of view that unless you're spending more money on something while you're not doing something, my view is if you can find a way to economize and spend the money you're already using and making it more effective, that's a better way to go. But uh, uh, so Build Back Better put everything on hold. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course, Build Back Better was seen as being a, a program that had to be carried out through reconciliation and therefore there would be no Republican involvement at all. Uh, any discussions we were having uh, were completely put on ice because Republicans weren't needed here, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and now of course, <laughs> excuse me, now, uh, that Build Back Better is uh, in limbo or worse. Uh, there's a, a growing uh, series of discussions going on among uh, members of the Senate at least, but also members of the House uh, to say, okay, let's go back and look once again at family security and children and think about a way that we might pass something on a bipartisan basis. Um, I presume as well, by the way, that the White House is working on a, a child care program that we, we passed through reconciliation. So there are a lot of avenues being pursued right now. But, uh, but I think the reason that the Family Security Act I proposed uh, sort of stopped in its tracks was that Build Back Better uh, was going to basically take over the entire real estate. So let me, let me ask you about, uh, about that, about kind of future uh, prospects for reform here. 
One of the surprising things to me about the expanded child tax credit um, is that it really hasn't been that popular. Uh, there are a lot of polls. You know, I have one from Morning Consult that says that uh, less than half of Americans think the credit should be extended for another year. Of course, it's expired, um, but they think the credit should have been extended for another year. Uh, and only two thirds of Democrats wanted to extend that credit. Why do you think that there, there hasn't been, been more support? I, I would have, if you had asked me uh, when, when that expansion passed, what I, what I would have predicted, I would have thought that the minute that uh, those checks started hitting um, Americans' uh, bank accounts, that, that that program was gonna be in permanent law forever. That doesn't seem to be the case. Americans seem to be quite ambivalent about it, including a lot of Democrats. Why do you think that is? Well, um, you know, I don't know that I have all the answers on this, but I, I can say that for uh, for people to uh, understand a, a program, it needs to be communicated to them. And I, I don't want to take any uh, unnecessary cheap shots at, at the Biden administration, but I'm not sure who the communications director is uh, for President Biden. But I don't think the communication strategy has been highly effective. Let's say that's the understatement of the morning. Uh, there was not an explanation as to what these checks were about. Was it COVID relief? Uh, that's how the uh, American Rescue Plan was described. And, and so people felt that these checks were going out to help uh, uh, cover the costs of COVID. And, uh, and so if COVID is going to hopefully go away, hopefully we don't have more uh, variants that extend its, uh, its, its impact on us. Uh, then I'm sure a lot of people thought, oh, well, it's, it's a COVID relief program, so it'll go away when COVID goes away. Uh, it, it just hasn't been explained to the American people. And I think, I think at some point, if there is an effort on the part of the administration and Congress to, to look at family security, that we'll need to go out and communicate and say, this is what we're dealing with. And what we're dealing with is this, which is that people want to have more children. We as a society want them to have enough children to at least to replace themselves as a society. And, uh, and so we're going to help those uh, that, uh, that want to have kids by providing uh, funding for them, uh, at least when the children are young, and, uh, and explain it in that way, describe it as being a payment that will go out on a monthly basis to help with the, the costs of raising a child and giving uh, uh, the mom or dad the choice to stay home and, uh, and, and help raise the, the child. So I, I think if it's communicated and is made a uh, a message in and of itself, it, it, it will receive a good deal of support. The challenge with Build Back Better, I don't have to tell you this, is that, that we Republicans were completely left out of it, in part because not a single one of our votes was necessary. Uh, we immediately saw everything that was wrong with it and pointed those things out. Uh, the Democrats uh, had all sorts of things to talk about, and no one of those things they spoke about got the kind of airtime they might otherwise want. So it didn't get the support it wanted. It got a, a lukewarm, at best, response from uh, from Republicans, and it's just kind of, uh, you know, floating around on uh, on the top of a of a turbulent sea, uh, without anybody willing to uh, pick it up and give it life. And uh, you know, I happen to think that family security and the need to maintain our civilization and our population, and to help families that want to have kids, is a topic big enough, important enough, to get airtime on its own. And, uh, and hope that if we do pick up this legislation on a bipartisan basis, that we'll be able to give it that. So you uh, uh, have the Family Security Act, monthly benefit for households with children, changes to the CTC, changes to the uh, earned income tax credit, you know, big debate. Then President Biden comes in, Build Back Better happens. Uh, the uh, expanded child credit uh, that existed in the president's COVID stimulus has expired. Americans seem more ambivalent about it continuing than uh, uh, many people would have thought. Uh, that's kind of where we are now. What specific changes uh, do you think need to happen to your proposal, to the Family Security Act, in order to uh, get it through the Senate? You know, I think uh, I, I should make it really clear. I'm, I'm pretty flexible. Um, uh, and, uh, and so if people are concerned that the the monthly checks uh, uh, stay on uh, too many years that uh, uh, instead of kids just getting to the first five or six years, it goes on until through their teen, teen years. Well, should we reduce that? I'm, I'm flexible on that front. 
doing so, re reducing the number of years would of course save money. Um, uh, there are some who feel, look, there needs to be some kind of a, a work association with those who are receiving these checks. And it's like, yeah, okay. Uh, my plan didn't require any work association. Perhaps we could say uh, prior to receiving checks of this nature, a single mom or a couple had to have at least earned, I don't know, $5,000 the prior year or $10,000 showing there's a connection to work. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, we, might, uh, uh, we might decide that, uh, uh, that the income level uh, for people who are receiving checks would be lower than that which I originally anticipated. Uh, uh, we kept kept things pretty much uh, using the precedence of four hundred thousand dollar figure, and and keeping the current program that uh, has a, a, a child tax credit up to four hundred thousand. We kept that level. Why you could bring it down to a lower level? So there are a number of adjustments you can make. The the biggest uh, challenge I think for Republicans and Democrats will be how are you going to pay for it? And uh, and my own view is that one by economizing uh, on how large the program is, but number two, uh, finding uh, ways to um, use funding from current programs, uh, like the earned income tax credit, which has a child portion of that, taking these dollars, which are already being used, perhaps TANF as well, using some of these dollars and repurposing them to this effort uh, is a way to make this uh, paid for. As you know, in my, in my original plan, uh, I said, look, let's get rid of the SALT deduction, uh, the, the $10,000 uh, deduction of SALT. That is overwhelmingly a benefit which goes to higher income people. Um, let's get rid of that. But as you know, Democrats are wedded to the SALT deduction. They'd like to make it even larger because, of course, it's, uh, it's something which benefits people in California, New York, and high income people. And that's where their donors are and a lot of voters are. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think we have to show some flexibility that the nature, I mean, you mentioned our bipartisan, uh, group that came together. We, we our, our bipartisan group, it was first eight, then it became 10. Now it's 22 of us. Uh, we, we first took out a COVID relief package, which we got through, uh, Congress. Then we went after infrastructure. Right now we're looking at the, uh, electoral account act and finding ways that we can work together to solve that. But what I'd note is when you work on a bipartisan basis, there's got to be give and take. And, and if it's all a Republican plan, it's not going to pass. And likewise, if it's all a Democrat plan, it's not going to pass. So I, I'm, I'm flexible. I, I recognize the concerns of people on the other side of the aisle. I, I would note that I have been speaking with uh, Democrats on uh, on this topic, I won't, I won't, uh, you know, call them out of the closet right now, uh, but uh, don't, don't want to get them in trouble. But I've been speaking with them. I sp one I mentioned, Joe B uh, Manchin, of course. He and I've spoken about his perspective many times. Uh, there's going to have to be some give and take here, but the the need to reform our current uh, programs and to get help to people who want to have children, I think, is real. And by the way, I note this as well, which is in my plan. I think this is really important in my plan. A woman who is pregnant, uh, I think it's when she becomes four or five months pregnant, she starts getting checks. And that's to help prepare for having the child uh, to get the kind of uh, equipment that you need at home and clothing and so forth. So it's, it, it really uh, also encourages people to, to decide to have a child if they become pregnant. Um, let me ask you about uh, Senator Manchin and, and about bipartisan cooperation. So some on the political left have, have drawn a sort of red line that any expansion of, of the child credit uh, should not include any sort of work requirement, uh, that people with zero dollars of earnings should get exactly the same credit as people with $30,000 of earnings or, or, or something, something like that. How do you respond to that group uh, that, that seem to oppose any efforts that might bring along uh, Senator Manchin himself, Senate Republicans into, into a, a bipartisan agreement? Well, as you know, in my uh, plan, as I originally proposed it, I did not have a work requirement, uh, but I've spoken with enough Democrats, including Joe Manchin, that insist that that's essential. And by the way, a number of Republicans as well say that's absolutely essential. There has to be a work requirement. Uh, and so then I say, okay, let's, let's see if we can uh, find a way to, to meet in the middle here. Uh, what happens if we, we look at someone's earnings before they have a child? Uh, and if there's someone who who, who's, let's say, been uh, receiving TANF or, or, or other government benefits, had no work whatsoever, and starts having kids and wants to get checks, maybe that's not a, a lifestyle we want to encourage. 
Uh, and so we might say, look, somebody who has, before they have a child, has had income of five, 10, 20,000, they should be eligible for being able to receive these, uh, these credits uh, going forward. So that would be one way to solve that problem. Uh, there's some, however, that, as you know, that say, look, you should only get as much in terms of credit for the child uh, as you're paying in taxes. So the more you work, the more you're gonna get for your child. Uh, that's something I understand, although I, I shy away from that because that creates a, a, a big incentive for both the husband and the wife to leave the home to earn more money. And um, I, I don't think we wanna create that, that kind of incentive. I think we wanna let them choose whether one of them wants to stay home and raise the child. So I'd, I'd probably be more in favor of saying, look, if, if, there's, if there's evidence of work in the home, where, where one or two of the uh, parents uh, is working, uh, or if there's evidence of work in the past and tax paying in the past, that's sufficient for me to say, hey, look, we want to help uh, uh, as you want to bring a, a child into the world. And, and again, you have to go back and say, what is it we're trying to do? There's some who feel, oh, this is an anti-poverty program. Well, that's not what I have in mind. Uh, there's some who say, this is the COVID relief uh, plan. Uh, that's not what I have in mind either. What I'm looking at is saying, how do we help people who want to have children and bring them into homes, responsible homes, how do we help those people be able to make a decision to actually have a child? Because we as a civilization, we as the people of the United States of America want to be able to reproduce our population uh, and, uh, and maintain uh, what has been uh, the, the foundation of our, our national strength. Let me... Uh ask you just to, to, to say more about that, Senator. You, you, you're, you're taking great pains to uh, stay neutral for families with two working parents versus with a stay-at-home parent. And, and you've mentioned um, a couple of times now about the uh, importance of giving families that, that freedom, uh, not putting a thumb on the scale. Why do you think that's so important? Well, I, you know, I, I, uh, I think we want to give parents uh, a recognition that they will be able to do what's right for their child and what they think is right for their child. And some parents will feel, you know, uh, I want to get my child into to child care. Uh, I want to get him into pre-K. I want to get him or her into school as quickly as I can. I think that's the best for them. And, and husband and wife both have, you know, careers uh, uh, or jobs that they want to keep doing. That, that's just fine. On the other hand, if, if uh, a couple or an individual feels, you know, I really want to raise this child myself, it's something that's important to me, uh, I want to give them the ability to make that choice. Uh, you know, we're a nation of free men and women uh, and, and structuring our programs not to, to compel people to, to choose a life which uh, is not in their interest as they understand it, I think is a mistake. I mean, my, I, I, I'll just tell you a brief personal story, which is that uh, my wife went to a uh, excellent high school, uh, went to a great uh, university, uh, had uh, plenty of economic opportunities, uh, but felt the thing she most wanted to be able to do was to able, be able to raise her, her children. Uh, and that was a choice that she made. It turned out to be an extraordinarily demanding choice. It required her to be, you know, psychologist, uh, physician, uh, short order cook. I mean, all the jobs in one, uh, but extraordinarily rewarding. When the kids finally left the nest, uh, she is now involved in, in having organized and helping lead a, a, a center for neurologic research. Uh, so she's able to get back into the workforce, if you will. Uh, uh, it's a volunteer entity. Uh, but, but that's how she wants to live her life. More power to her and to others like her who want to live their lives in the way they think uh, are best for them. I, I am a believer in the market, in people being able to make the choices which they feel are best. And I believe that if you allow that to happen, you'll end up with stronger families, stronger values, stronger culture, and a stronger economy. So, uh, you know, Pushing people back into the workforce when they would rather raise a child is not something I want to do. And by the way, keeping them from the workforce, if they want to go into the workforce, is also not something I want to do. Uh, Senator, I, I feel like we could we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about this, but I want to be respectful of your time, and I'm receiving a, a, a flurry of messages from my colleagues. Uh, let, me, let me close with just one final question. Uh, can you handicap the odds of an expansion of the child tax credit 
passing at some point in, you know, say uh, before the before the midterm elections? Is that do you think that's more likely or or less likely that we'll that we'll see an expansion of the credit before the midterms? My, my capacity to judge what's going to happen in Congress is particularly poor, <laughs> and uh, uh, so you know I just can't tell you. I I, uh, I do remember I was talking to to Lamar Alexander uh, just as he was leaving the Senate, and, and he said he said Mitt, don't don't despair if you work on a piece of legislation and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. He said what often happens around here is that something is has been worked on it has good supporters and and it's ready to go and it just never gets a chance to be voted on and he said and then then what happens is something starts to move and people feel there's a need to do something that relates to what you've worked on and they grab something you've worked on he said i've had legislation that i worked on 20 years ago get pulled into a new ent you know entity and become and become law and he said, so keep on pushing on those things. So I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't handicap uh, the likelihood of this happening this year. Uh, but I think you're going to see, we're going to reform the, the way we help families and their kids. Uh, we're going to stop the disincentives for, uh, for marriage. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to make it easier for people to have children because we're going to recognize as a society, we want more kids, not fewer. We want to replace ourselves. And we want to give moms and dads the choice they feel they want to have uh, how they, about how they're going to live their life and raise their kids. Well, you, you, you can't blame me for trying. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Senator Robbie, for your leadership on these important issues. Thank you for your leadership on, on so many other critically important issues. And, and thank you for being with us here uh, this afternoon. Thanks so much. All the best. Hi there, my name is Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow in economic studies uh, at the Brookings Institution and a member of this working group. Um, and I'm going to be picking up here, I think, uh, Michael. I just want to thank you for that uh, interview with Senator Romney and Diane for her intriguing exchange with uh, Chair Rouse as well. And you even, I don't know if this was deliberate, you even got him to mention the SALT deduction. Uh, which is something that is actually specifically mentioned in the report, uh, as well as the kind of give and take that's going on. So uh, thank you for that, Michael. And I, I think it's my responsibility now to kick off, uh, kick off the panel. Yes, there were, uh, before you do, let me just say, in addition to the salt reduction, there were two, uh, I think there were two uh, themes that Senator Robney kept uh, returning to that, that are very much themes of the report. One uh, is the need to rebalance uh, federal expenditures toward children and away from uh, affluent mm. uh, adults, which uh, of course uh, taking money from the SALT deduction and spending it on kids would do. Uh, and the second uh, was the, the importance of, of marriage and, and, and the importance of, of uh, good family life and, and raising children. I think that's right. Uh, he also talked about the give and take. Uh, and give and take is what we've been doing for the last two years and what we're going to have our panelists talk about. Uh, so if we get, I'm hoping that the panelists are going to be uh, joining us now. Uh, I will very, very briefly introduce them as we kind of run through to our close uh, one. But uh, thanks, Mike, for, for doing that part. OK, good. The panelists are on. Thank you all for, for joining. Um, so I was a member, proud to be part of the working group. And everyone you're about to hear from is a member of the working group as well. What, what we're going to do is just very, very briefly, we're going to completely unfairly ask uh, each uh, speaker to, in about two minutes, summarize two years of work. Uh, and also, uh, if you could, and I think it'd be easier just for you to do this as part of your uh, brief opening comments, if you wouldn't mind, just to say, point to one area where there really, it really was a kind of sticking point, right? To use the give and take, where it was like, like it felt like it was a lot of give and take before we got to a conclusion. And then perhaps one area where you were pleasantly surprised by how quickly we kind of did reach a consensus. And so I'm not gonna do long introductions um, for everybody. I will kind of briefly just hand over between everybody, but you're first gonna hear from David Deming at Harvard. Please look at the uh, bios online. Then Lisa Ganetian from Duke, uh, Brad Wilcox from AI and UVA, and then Coastly uh, Simon. And they're gonna be dealing respectively with the issues of education, with child development, with family, uh, and with health. And then uh, we're also going to have time for Q&A. So hashtag ask AI econ or the email that's on there. And so with that impossible task, I'm going to hand to you, David. 
All right, thank you, Richard. Uh, it's such a delight to be here and to work with everybody um, on this important volume. <clears throat> so I wanted to um, quickly just come back to something that Chair Rouse said at the beginning about investments in children and why resource disparities and poverty in particular matter more for children. And the reason is that um, public investment in children is like cultivating a vegetable garden. Your task is to create the right conditions so that your garden can thrive. And that requires a good environment, uh, sunshine, water, or a family in the case of children, but it also requires sometimes some upfront spending, speeds, fertilizer, topsoil, et cetera. And there's no guarantee, but if the investment works, it gets repaid in the form of something to eat, maybe a smaller grocery bill. And so just like investing in a, or cultivating a garden, investing in children, if you invest wisely, means you can reap what you sow and maybe even a little bit more. So like Chair Rouse mentioned, the work of Harvard economist Nathan Hendren and others has shown that investments in children actually pay themselves back over time in the form of increased tax revenue that comes from higher earnings. And that's why fighting child poverty makes sense, not only from an equity perspective, but also from a dollar and cents perspective, as long as it's done well. Uh, and so that's what this volume is about, is trying to figure out the best way to invest more in kids, not only because it's a moral imperative, but also because it's a fiscal imperative. Um, and that said, you know, we don't want to just say, well, it pays for itself and therefore we're not going to commit to any pay force. We've actually gone above and beyond committed to some pay force um, because we, we think it's important to take a stand on budget neutrality. Details are in the volume, but just to give you a sense, we think the pay force ought to come from cuts to entitlement programs that benefit upper middle class and affluent seniors, uh, so-called corporate welfare, including agricultural subsidies, subsidies to well-off households and the federal tax code and increased tax enforcement. So we've run those numbers and, and we think we can make that work. So let me just in my one remaining minute talk specifically about education since that's my area of focus. Broadly speaking, the group is unanimous in thinking that we as a country ought to be laser focused on increasing the academic achievement of poor children. This really is a problem of poverty and a problem of inequality. Uh, well-off children do very well on internationally normed tests. Just to give you an example, a well-off state like Massachusetts performs about as well as China or Singapore on international assessments, but too many children in all 50 states don't perform well enough. And in today's knowledge-based economy, it really is almost impossible to succeed if you leave school with deficits in basic academic skills like literacy and numeracy. And so um, we have to make sure that all kids leave school with the knowledge they need to succeed and public policies ought to work backward from that goal regardless of the politics behind them. And that leads us to some interesting and surprising conclusions. So what does it mean concretely? It means that money really matters um, and it matters more when you're starting from a low base. So spending um, on education for poor kids matters more, but it also really matters how the money is spent. Um, so every child, poor or not, deserves a high quality teacher in a well-resourced classroom with a reasonable student-teacher ratio, delivering safe instruction in person with the wraparound resources needed to meet students' diverse learning needs. So more spending overall, but directed, laser-focused on productive uses of the money. Sometimes that means extra tutoring, differentiated instruction, and even charter schools and school choice models when they are based on demonstrated evidence of effectiveness and when we have high standards of accountability for them. So basically prepare every child for the knowledge economy by any means necessary. Thanks. Great. And if you just very briefly do, I think we'll just do this as we go through now in sure. time. Big, biggest row, biggest sticking point, and okay. easy, easiest, easiest conclusion win. Yes. So I think the easiest conclusion was we, we very quickly reached the goal together as a group, which is focus on poor children, prepare children for today's economy. That was, to me, a surprisingly easy sell. I think the row was um, standards of evidence, which have changed quite dramatically in recent years. There used to be an old conventional wisdom that money doesn't matter in education. And when we started, there was a discussion about does money really matter? You know, is it all about incentives? And I felt like the panelists um, who didn't know the, the, the recent research letter as well as I do, since um, I work on this topic, um, were very open-minded um, and very kind of presuming of good faith in reviewing recent evidence on the fact that money actually does matter. And that's from well-identified causal studies. There's a bunch of them out there. And so the chapter really reflects that relatively new consensus. So that was a, that was a, a fun argument at first, but I think it, we landed in a productive place. Yes. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, and I, I agree. I think there was a spirit of, like, let's try and find out what's true here and try as far as possible not to be uh, weighed down by our priors. Great, okay, I'm gonna move next to Lisa to talk a bit about resources, but also specifically in the context of child development. Great, thank you, Richard. Um, first, I just wanna say it was an honor to work on this group and I think really exemplifies what it means to compromise. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off on the two dimensions that we were asked to speak about. So I'm gonna start with the easy areas of agreement. Um, first off, the science of the developing brain has continued to propel policy around childhood and underscores important windows investment opportunity. And this is a theme that is strong and centered in two of the chapters of this report, 
importantly on early childhood and then the second chapter on teens really showcase the importance of this science and how it can intersect and can actually inform and guide how we think about the returns to policy and policy investments. Um, the second is the role of the family and how fundamental that is to children's development at every age and every developmental milestone. And throughout the chapters from the resources all the way through the focus on the two chapters in early childhood and adolescence, um, this is pretty broad. This includes safe and enriching environments, loving caregiving relationships, nurturing interactions, and for teens, monitoring and balancing opportunities to support healthy exploration and autonomy. And I'll go ahead and really make the strong link here with the stability of household economic resources as one backbone to supporting this role of the family. And then the third that I think was you know, relatively easy for us to come to some agreement is how much relationships matter. Um, and the quality of relationships being represented across the various adults that children engage with, that includes teachers, that includes family members, it includes siblings. And these are all key ingredients for healthy development. And so there were you know, many creative tensions around um, thinking about children's development and even thinking about resources. Um, I wanna to point to a few of those. Um, one was um, reckoning with equal and equality of opportunity for all children. Um, children in the US are born in unequal circumstances. Even children with equal household income at birth face different odds um, due to many structural barriers that have contributed to wealth disparities by race, housing, neighborhood segregation, residing in communities with differential access and quality of public goods. You can think about safe water, safe communities, parks, libraries, transportation, internet. The second is while there was agreement on supporting success for each child, it was really hard to reach consensus on one way forward. Much of the empirical evidence that we leaned on throughout this report points in certain directions very productively but also reflects a typical or average child. But we know no one child is typical or average. Um, and this con contributed to lots of creative tension on how policy supports successful pathways and how to prioritize those investments. Um, some of these tensions you heard already over the course of this conversation. So is it cash? Is it cash during early childhood? Is it education? Is it home visiting or early education programs? Perhaps it's all of them. And I just wanna raise the third creative tension related to this. So I've learned from my child development colleagues that children need different things at different times. And their well-being is actually an accumulation of investments that starts early and cascades as children grow and develop. And this holistic view is really hard to map onto policy. We heard um, the theme of patience and the importance of patience, but there's something else, which is how do we think about stitching together programs and policies to be seamless and nimble and serve the changing needs of children. Thanks, Lisa. I, I agree. The very often when people say creative tension, there was that's to disguise the fact that it was mostly tension. But in our case, there was plenty of creativity as well. And I do think that this issue of the more organic approach to kids, uh, rather the industrial conveyor belt approach, is, is incredibly complex. Right, the, the dynamic complementarity that you've kind of been referring to just makes it very much more difficult. And it speaks a bit, I think, to David's organic metaphor. Right. Um, rather than thinking of kids as units of human capital going along a conveyor belt, waiting for us to kind of pour in just the right amount of capital, it's more like some a growing plant, and they grow at different stages at different uh, different times. So, I love the way you put that. Thank you. All right, we got Brad. Uh, Brad on family. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Richard. So, I think the report underlines uh, the children are more likely to flourish when they're raised by two married parents, and that's because marriage is tied, at least in the U.S. context, to commitment to family stability, to more money, and it also tends to raise the odds that kids are welcomed or intended by both of their parents. It's kind of four you know, things that we agreed on as, as a group. And of course, the tragedy I think of this moment in this particular domain of the report is that for all of its benefits, marriage is less likely today to anchor kids' uh, lives. And we're also seeing, of course, a kind of marriage divide where more educated and affluent families uh, continue to sort of do you know family life uh, in and through marriage? About ninety percent of kids raised by college-educated moms are being raised by married uh, parents. By contrast, working class and poor kids are much more likely to experience family instability. Only about two thirds of kids 
with less educated moms have married parents. So all this matters because kids are more likely to, to avoid poverty and prison, they're more likely to flourish in school and graduate from college um, when they have the benefit of two married parents. So again, our world is, is increasingly one where kids from educated and affluent families are in a sense doubly advantaged. Their parents have more money, more education on the one hand, but also they're able to give their kids more family stability. Um, and then the opposite of, is true for, for kids often uh, from poor working class families. So, you know, one of, I think, the burdens of the report is to sort of think about ways to kind of bridge this marriage divide, bridge this family divide in America. And we, you know, mentioned steps like reducing marriage penalties, of course, a point made also by Senator Romney earlier in our conversation today. And thinking too about things like a campaign uh, on behalf of the success sequence, where we'd be encouraging them adults to put education, work, and marriage uh, before the baby carriage. And so that would you know, encourage folks to kind of take cultural steps that would increase their odds of flourishing uh, both you know, financially and in terms of family stability. Now, in terms of you mentioned kind of what were uh, points of tension, I think among us and what was sort of relatively easy for us to sort of tackle. Um, now, obviously this issue is, is quite sensitive. Um, and I think, in terms of what was more difficult was sort of basically making it clear that we were not intending here to sort of be finger wagging or, you know, blaming anyone for, you know, family instability of one sort or another. And then also we weren't trying to kind of minimize the ways in which economic um, changes in our country, the ways in which, uh, you know, racial, um, you know, segregation and racism have kind of played a role in structuring our American families. So we kind of had to get everyone to sort of understand that, you know, talking about family structure is not, um, you know, a kind of <laughs> a right wing uh, sort of agenda, so to speak, um, where I think that there was, you know, um, an easier time of it than I anticipated was kind of like there was a general recognition part of, you know, most of the scholars involved in this process, that the research is pretty clear that kids benefit from stable two parent families. And so there was less of a need to kind of, you know, uh, re, um, Reinterrogate that that body of research, and you know more kind of a, you know we're just able to sort of think about well, you know given this body of research, you know um, how do we kind of explain it to to the intelligent like you know public um, who might read this report, and think about constructive ways um, to build uh, bipartisan um, you know policies, and then also kind of you know private efforts to uh, strengthen and stabilize families. Yep. Thanks, Brad. Um, I, I want to move on, but I'll make I'll make a statement uh, uh, and see if you agree with it, because you've been trying to persuade liberals, those center left people about the importance of marriage for a very long time now. Um, my observation is that the argument is shifting partly because of the gap, the marriage gap, that as you see these class gaps really kind of opening it up, that changes the discussion. Uh, and it makes it more of an equity discussion when you do see such huge differences by class in marriage. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's slight, that's actually making it somewhat easier for you in a way to make the argument for marriage when you see so many of those who have means choosing marriage? Yeah, Richard, I think that was true about a decade ago. I'm not, I'm not sure today, really, to be honest. I think that there is, we're, I think we're kind of surprisingly kind of revisiting this issue in at least in many academic and, and sort of, um, you know, public context. So, you know, I, I, I agree. I think it is the case. There is this big class divide um, here that continues to sort of grow. And I think, you know, it'd be nice to sort of bridge that divide. But that does require, I think, the willingness to sort of, um, you know, think about the ways in which a stable marriage, you know, is, you know, a, a benefit to people across yeah. the spectrum. So. You have to, yeah, you have to win the first argument first. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Okay, Kosley, if you wouldn't mind talking a bit about our work on health. Thank you, Richard. And, and, and thank you for all the work of the panel and the working group. It really was uh, an honor and a privilege to be part of this process because it was really astounding to see how much we did agree on and could and, and had evidence to back up. And, and, and this is why it takes so long to come to consensus because these are complex topics. So I wanna highlight some of the things that came through in the health area. First, it, it bears repeating that we, we agree there's this concerning lack of balance in prioritizing children in the national budget and this point that's been made, but I wanna emphasize, it's very much the case in health spending too. And, and that this did not improve during the pandemic. We agree that rebalancing towards 
kids is needed because it's very clear from the research evidence that the investments in children shape their adult economic and health experiences too. Also very important, we agreed to view supports for parents, especially in the mental health well-being of parents as investments in children too, because many kids grow up in families that experience trauma. And there's the, the impact of the opioid epidemic that's been felt even before the pandemic. And parents and kids' mental well-being closely tied. Um, last but not least, we want to recognize and reinforce how powerful public financing of children's health insurance has been for child health security. Through the Medicaid program, we have made investments we need to keep building on in well child care, in, in early detection during all periods, in the prenatal period, and protecting children's healthy environments, such as through reducing lead exposure. There's, in, in some estimates, more than half of investments in public financing of children's health insurance is made back through higher earnings alone later in life. And there are many other outcomes than just the, the, the job market outcomes. Um, talk a bit now about what are the things that we, we found complicated, again, the reason why this report took three years is because it's, it's, it's really useful to have these discussions, see what areas that we feel there's more evidence needed on and to go back, look for that evidence and then return to discuss and see how can we come up with a, what, what, what is it that we agree on and can then say here are what's needed. So there, there is a lot of areas that even though we have evidence on many things, we really want to know more. We keep coming across things where we say, oh, it's surprising. We haven't seen these questions answered. So there's a huge, rich research agenda for the future as well. But, um, and, and, and as Brett discussed, you know, one of the topics we found complicated throughout our work process as a team was of the role of marriage itself. For example, thinking about how marriage rates are not equal across society because many people view adequate resources as a barrier to marriage itself, but our research substantiated the importance of having both parents involved in children's lives in health and resources being higher. Um, it was far easier to draw conclusions on investments in children paying off while still viewing childhood as well as, as the adult years. I think that's a really useful perspective in the rebalancing debate because this is not then seen as taking away from adult well-being. This is, uh, in fact, it could be seen as a win-win in that. Thank you, Kosli. Actually, we're going to go to questions now. Thank you to all of you for being so succinct. Um, before I do that, uh, in case we run out of time at the end, I, I want to take the opportunity now uh, to say a couple of thanks to Diane Schatzenbach, who's really been the kind of originator and leader of this effort. And we just said three years, Coast, that's probably right. I said two earlier, but I don't know. There's like dog years and there's pandemic years. So I don't know, two, whatever it is. Uh, and also Lauren Bauer, a colleague at Brookings Institution, who's been kind of guiding the effort. So huge thanks to them, but especially to our fearless leader, Diane Schatzenbach, who's, who's got us to this point. One mess, one of the questions we've already had, Coastly, is actually about um, mental health care, which is obviously something we, do, we speak about quite a lot in the report. And something as simple as the role of screening particularly for for kids like do we know what's happening and and could we build into our healthcare systems just better knowledge through kind of more regular screening and so on is that something that you could speak to i think this is when we, we think about this as a success that we have had good screening programs through public financing but then there's always the glass is half empty half full because Right now, we think there is so much that's going to go undetected right now. We need to really invest in thinking about more creative ways to engage in screening than we have right now. So I think it's, it's, it's thinking, how do, we, how do we build the screening systems and the ways we respond given current situations where even what we've invested in is, 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 is just not holding up really well. Right. And the two, the two generation thing too, about maternal, you know, we talk about the importance of maternal mental health too, and screening there too. Okay. So there's another question here, which I'm going to summarize. It's, it's, it's a fairly long question, but it boils down to, you say pre-K is great, 
but isn't the latest evidence that it's not great, including Head Start evaluations. And there's obviously a new, a new study out of Tennessee uh, by Dale Farron, et cetera. Uh, and so are we, over, are we over, overemphasizing the importance of pre-K given that the evidence seems at best to be mixed? And I'm gonna suggest maybe David and or Lisa can have a crack at that. David, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I can give an answer to that. It's a complicated question, but I think the answer is it very much depends on whether you're comparing the impact of having preschool to the impact of having nothing or staying at home versus the impact of one preschool versus the other. So if you look at the Perry Preschool Project, Carolina Absent Area, and other programs around the generation ago, there were no public pre-Ks back then. There were very few private pre-Ks. And so most of the kids who were in the control group in those experiments got nothing. Whereas today in a Tennessee pre-K program or even a Head Start, you're comparing it to often another program. And so it's a different policy question. Should we privilege one program versus the other? But most of the evidence that I've seen on the benefits of pre-K suggests that um, upping access to it as close to 100% as possible is tremendously beneficial for kids. But um, arguing about um, different ways of differentiating the quality between relatively high quality programs is probably not worth it. And so I think what you see in the Tennessee case is you see that the program itself was not that high quality relative to the alternatives. And so therefore the evaluation showed that it didn't have an impact. But again, it's not pre-K versus nothing. It's Tennessee public pre-K versus some other private pre-K people were in. So it's just a different comparison. Right, right. So we just need to be important what we're saying. And I think we are, uh, I think we are, we're, we're careful about what we're saying, I should, I should say. Uh, Lisa, do you, you want to add anything yeah, to that? Yeah, I wanted to chime in. I'm going to go back to mental health, actually, and not to pre-K, hmm. if that's oh, okay. Sure. I just wanted to point out that um, one of the chapters in the report on teenagers really focuses on mental health and teen mental health. And while screening is certainly going to be important and thinking about that strategically from a public finance perspective, there's a couple of other things that are um, associated with that and thinking uh, about kind of shifting society. Um, one is around norms and stigma and how we think about schools as platforms, right, and particularly for supporting teens. So I just wanted to kind of pivot that and broaden the lens. It's not just about identification and diagnoses, but also about reducing stigma shaping social norms and feeling like teens are supported through their difficult kind of social and emotional development. Great. And Richard, just quickly on pre-K, I forgot to say, there's a recent study of the Boston pre-K program by some of my colleagues at MIT and, and Berkeley finding basically, this is a lottery-based design. They found no impact at all on achievement of kids who entered the Boston pre-K program, but then 20 years later, they were more likely to attend college. So right. I think it's important to say that the benefits of pre-K are not always about test scores in kindergarten, which if anybody has a kindergartner knows, those test scores are relatively, um, re relatively, you know, they don't reflect the real learning that's happening in the classroom, let's just yeah, say. That's very carefully said, yeah. Uh, but you're right, you do get these sleeper effects or long run effects. And Chair Rouse, I think was like, she had this nice line in her comments at time, which said, and then you wait, and then you wait. And this idea of kind of patient capital, that you see in the private sector, I think we, we need patient policy as well very often and lack of patience is, is a problem. And one of the other questions we've got, um, which I think speaks to a, a theme that, of today's session generally, and maybe Brad, you wanna have a crack at this first, but it's really the kind of one gen versus two gen question, I think. The question here is, are we better served? If we wanna help kids, are we, are, are we better served by just directing resources and money as directly towards kids as possible? In other words, are bypassing the parent almost just go to get it to the kids somehow or other or through the parents and of course it's not it's not that binary very often the way to get it through kids is uh is through parents but you can see what's what's going on there very often people say just help parents help them get work help them get money help them get skills and it'll sort of trickle down effectively to the kids and like, no no we need a child allowance we need pre-k we need to direct the resource directly at children so it's more of a kind of one gen approach to be slightly unfair um where do you think we land on that brad and how do you think about that well, you know, I think we're trying to help both obviously parents and kids in the report and there are different, you know, pieces of policy recommendations that would be directed more towards kind of securing um, the, the parents. And obviously my section when it comes to thinking about the marriage penalty is sort of we're trying to basically, you know, minimize policies that end up making it you know, harder for working class parents, especially, you know, to get married and, and stay together. So that's sort of, you know, a more of a a parent focused approach, but there are other obviously parts of this report, like the ones Dave was just talking about, where we're kind of directly targeting kids. And I think kind of more broadly, obviously, you know, any successful effort to help kids um, has to work directly with them, but also has to acknowledge that they're kind of nested in these larger institutions. First and foremost, of course, is the family, um, but then, you know, the neighborhood, the schools, um, and then a, a larger array of institutions. And so 
it's definitely a, a both and perspective mm -hmm. um, that must carry the day for, you know, for our kids. Yeah. So we've had another question, which is a, a, an interesting one. And I think one that we, we allude to um, rather than directly address, um, which is what, what is the role of employers? So we do mention the various stakeholders and so on in the report. Um, and I think this applies across the themes. So I've just, I'm just going to open this up and see if anyone's interested here in kind of what your initial reactions are, either in, in your own field or more generally, because we have a tendency, of course, to think public policy, right? So maybe it's private policy, it's like parents and families and so on, and then it's public policy. By that, we tend to think government or whatever level. But there's also corporate policy, there's institutional policy, there's organizational policy. And given the power that employers have, in the labor market uh, to shape sort of family life and given that the family is now an economic institution. Um, I wonder if any of you would like to, to re react to that. What, what's, if you're an employer listening to this conversation and I, I'm, I'm, I buy it, I buy the rebalancing, what should I do differently when I go into the, the office tomorrow? Anyone? Yeah, it's a difficult question, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, go on, Lisa. Uh, I mean, I'll give I'll give a shot at starting the conversation. Yeah. I think one is to recognize your employees are parents, um, and that you know there is a tension with the demands that you put on your employees to be productive and contributing to whatever the output and you know is of your business, um, and that they're juggling that with also a very yeah. another very important job, which is to be a parent. Um, and so, you know, if I were an employer, I would be asking myself, am I doing the best I can to maximize both ends, right? The mm. productivity of what's happening at the home and the productivity of what's happening with my um, employees here. I think often there, there's not so much, a, there's a, sometimes a disconnect in those dual goals. Right. I mean, it's, it's sort of shocking to me in a way that, that, that our labor market institutions are relatively unchanged over the last few decades by comparison to the family. Right. And particularly women's labor supply. Brad, did you want to add something? Yeah. I mean, I want to kind of this a little bit differently, actually, more from actually your, your vantage point, Richard. And that is, I think we have to sort of think more about the way in which the growing number of less educated and lower income men who are not working full time, um, you know, makes them much less appealing as husbands. But I also kind of think sends a kind of an implicit message that David Otter has written about, um, you know, in his more popular writing. And I think we need to think about kind of ways to, that we can kind of reconnect. Um, lower income men, less educated men to the labor force in ways that will benefit them, their adult relationships, but also kind of be an important sign to their kids, particularly to their young boys that, you know, there's a place for their boys in the future economy, you know, in the 21st century economy. And unless and until we can kind of reintegrate those men into our schools our high schools, technical, you know, colleges, um, and of course the, the labor force, um, we're not going to be doing what, what we can and should be to give our, you know, the next generation, particularly, you know, boys, um, you know, the, the best sort of environment and sort of ethos that they can kind of look to as they move into adolescence and then adulthood. Great, thanks. I think I'll try and squeeze in one more question maybe before the, the clock hits hard, which is, it's framed here as a food deserts question, um, but I think it could be broadened out into a place question. One of the things we know is, that place matters, that neighborhoods matter, that in between the individual or the family and big institutions, that neighborhoods matter, that, that social capital matters, et cetera. Uh, and that's partly about access to food, but it's about access to all kinds of things. And so, um, Coastly, I'm gonna put you on the spot, but please feel free to put the spot on someone else if you, if you want. But how do you think about place and the role of neighborhoods, perhaps particularly around health and this food deserts way, but more generally for the flourishing of children? in place and in space? I think this goes back to the question you asked about, should resources be directed at parents or at children? And, and the answer is that we have policies that are directing at all levels because I think a big takeaway from our discussions in the working group was that every level matters, individual, family, community, national. So in, in terms of place, lots of things, like when we look at what happens in child obesity rates is point pinpointed to the lack of availability of parks, areas where children can be safely active. And so that's a very linkable topic there to think we should be investing in place as well and not just thinking that resources that go to the individual will create all that's needed for healthy living for children. Yeah, I was thinking about David's organic metaphor as well. And Lisa, what you said about 
child development and i think and, and, and also kind of brain plasticity and so on and we, we think about the family learning environment but we also have to think about the community learning environment right i would i would just add too that you know schools are probably one of our most important place-based institutions right. you know community institutions and so investment in schools is place-based policy and making sure that every school even if it serves predominantly even especially if it serves predominantly poor children has the resources it needs you know to invest in those kids appropriately and to give them what they need to flourish I think that is place-based policy and it's something that is very much in, in the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish here with the volume. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, we are now up against time. And so uh, it remains to me just to thank, uh, thank my um, fellow working group members and panelists for uh, the conversation we just had. Uh, everyone who's taken part uh, in the event today, especially, of course, uh, Chair Rouse uh, and Senator Romney, uh, so ably interviewed by Diane Schatzbach and Michael Strain. And thank you to all of you who are watching this live or who are watching this later. And um, please do download the report, uh, look at the work that's been going on to get us to this point. And if you have children, or you know children, or you encounter a child, please be kind to them and remember that they are, as the cliche goes, the future. And thanks again for your attention. Bye, everybody.